Hello and welcome uh, to uh, my, our webinar. So uh, this webinar is What is Good Progress? So my name is Dale Pickles. I'm the director of B Squared. Uh, and if you're new to B Squared, we've been involved in the education market now for over 20 years, primarily focused on special needs. Uh, and we provide um, assessment software and products to help uh, show the small sets of progress for pupils with SEND. Um, so this webinar has come about because what is good progress is the question we've been asked a lot this year. Um, it's something everyone's trying to work out what is good progress after the removal of P levels. Um, and it's something we're going to try and help schools answer in uh, this evening's session. Um, so this webinar, um, like our other webinars, it will run in two sections. It'll be the main presentation, which will last this time around 60 minutes because it's quite a big one. And hopefully there'll be a lot of content which you'll all enjoy. Uh, after that, there'll be a Q&A session. Uh, so you get to ask questions, which we, I will try and answer. Um, everyone's microphone is muted, so you can all hear me without any interruptions. Um, and you can either save your questions uh, till the queue at the, at the end, or if you type them into the webinar control panel in the chat, um, I will try and answer them as I go if I can, or I may hold them back to the end. Um, once this webinar's finished, we'll spend time um, editing it and making it look nice for our website and it'll be up on our blog page in the next 48 hours so you'll be able to share that with um, your staff um, and also there will be some uh, handouts you'll find useful uh, so some are we've written there's also some from um, the DFE as well which hopefully um, you'll find useful um, at the end of this webinar there will be a short survey uh, which I'll ask you to complete um, it will help us out um, to sort of understand where schools are, where you're going next, uh, and also help us plan future webinars. So this webinar is, is focusing on what good progress looks like for pupils with SEND in both special school settings and in mainstream settings. So it's for all those working below age rated expectations um, where they're not making the big steps and you need to find a way of showing what good progress looks like for you. So, in this webinar, these are the sort of things I'll be covering. So, what does Ofsted say? What is data? How do I use it? What is good progress? Am I measuring the right thing? What does good progress look like? How important is engagement? Evolving how we look at progress is tracking towards outcomes. The answer, expectations of progress and effective monitoring. And also, finally, what do I tell Ofsted? So, they're the sort of things I'll be covering in this webinar um, over the next hour. Um, as I said, any questions, please just ask as they come available. Right, so the first thing. Everyone's come here looking for the Holy Grail. That's what you're all after. You want to know exactly what is good progress. How do I know what is good progress? Sadly, there is no Holy Grail. There is no set of values or simple formula to tell you if there is progress is good enough. It is going to be really unique. Okay, and this is actually a good thing because if you use a formula or you use a set of numbers to judge progress, that is someone judging your children's progress who's never met the children, um, don't understand what their needs are, the difficulties that child faces. So to me, it's much more important that judgment should be reached by the professionals who work with the child, who know the child, and understand what for that child is a big achievement. Um, so the first bit we're gonna go into is sort of the Ofsted and DFE stuff. And previously, the DFE have been very prescriptive, they've told us, all the different stuff, so you've got the numeracy and the literacy strategies, um, where everyone was teaching exactly the same stuff every week across the whole country, very prescriptive. Um, over the last five, six, seven, eight years, the government have either listened to feedback and made schools more autonomous, or looked at how to save money and stop telling schools what to do, wrapped it up under the uh, guise of, uh, we're giving you what your freedom that you've asked for. Problem is, making someone autonomous requires support. Um, to give someone the responsibility to make all these decisions, you have to support them in making those decisions. So the government, as part of the autonomy, should have been putting that support in, but they haven't. So schools have been left to fend for themselves, come up with their stuff on their own, uh, and magically sort of come up with that um, out of their own tiny pot of money. Um, and across the country, there's still not enough support for guidance for schools around SEND. Um, so education professionals know their children the best of the best people to make decisions for them. As I said, they still need guidance and support from the government and local authorities to make those decisions. 
Um, the Rocks Review, they did a number of recommendations. Some have already been implemented, um, but some of them looking at uh, initial teacher training and uh, continual professional development, um, that still isn't coming through. And um, somebody we work with is going through teacher training at the moment. And in her first year, I think she had one seminar on SEND. Yet around 20% of the pupils have SEND at some point. So there should be a lot more content on SEND than there is currently. So let's go move on to the Ofsted section. So we've got some Ofsted myths. So the first few quite big ones, that so Ofsted did not expect performance and people tracking information to present in a particular format. It should be provided uh, in the format the schools use and how they would monitor progress of pupils in that school. So what does that mean? It means you can use any tracking system you want in any format. The big thing is though, what the Ofsted are looking for is how you're using that information. What does that information tell you? How useful is that to you? And is it allowing you to make changes in your school um, that will improve the education for your pupils? Um, inspectors will consider performance information, data analysis in whatever format the school uses. Again, what suits you in your pupils and helps you make those changes. Often miss again, what often does not require schools to predict their attainment and progress scores. Now that addition of the word scores is quite important because um, generally you're looking at this couple of key stage one and key stage two where you've got the uh, scaled scores. It's asking you to not predict the scaled score. So what, how many children will meet to be at expected because that changes each year based on the number of children and the scores children achieve. So you cannot predict the attainment and progress scores. Okay. Um, so attainment of past people does not determine inspection outcomes. Um, so it helps identify where they should be inquiring, but it doesn't decide. Um, historically, that's not always been the case, uh, but hopefully it is making some change. Um, and there is no expectation about how primary schools should carry out assessments or record people's achievements in any subject, including foundation subjects. So schools won't be marked down because they're not recording geography in the same way they're doing for English and maths. And inspectors will discuss with school leaders their curriculum vision and ambitions for their pupils, including consideration for the EBAC subjects as part of the curriculum offer. Um, right, the offset ins inspection frameworks. This is the latest one, so uh, 189. Um, inspectors will recognise that published data for small groups of children must be treated with caution. So I won't read all of these out because they're quite long. But it says it will be misleading to compare national rates of progress attainment with progress attainment rates for small groups or the groups that have high proportion of pupils with special educational needs arising from their low cognitive abilities. Okay, so they're already saying for those groups, it, the uh, data looking at the cohort may not be reliable. Uh, 190 ranks in schools record for the progress of current pupils. Inspectors will recognize schools are at different points in the move towards adapting a system assessment without levels. And 198, um, inspectors will consider the progress of pupils who have special educational needs and or disabilities in relation to the progress of all pupils nationally with similar starting points. Now, this is a really interesting one because I keep hearing um, through talking to professionals on Facebook groups and various things that there is the expectation that a child in year six working at year two should, it should make exactly the same progress as their peers. They should make a year's worth of progress like their mainstream. Um, I can't, cannot find any, any evidence to back that up. Um, so what they're saying there is for a child in working at year two in year six, they'll be looking at other children at the same starting point for looking at progress. But in reality, what I'll get to in a bit, is they're only really looking here across the key stage. Because we have no P levels or levels or standardized um, system within the key stage, they cannot look at this within the key stage. They can only look at it across the key stage um, from key stage one up to key stage two. Okay. So there are changes around that. So 200, for groups of people who have such that their attainment is unlikely to ever rise above low. Um, the judgment that will be based on an evaluation of the pupils' learning and progress relative to their starting point at particular ages and any assessment measures the school holds. So evaluation should not take account of their attainment compared to that of all other pupils. So nice and clearly, well not quite clearly, but take each pupil's attainment individually. Don't try and group them or compare them. Um, from the Ofsted blog in September, uh, so Nick Whitaker wrote, um, 
and I think we've all recognised schools who do this. Um, if you, some schools will reject people's SEND because it will affect their results. And if you do take people's SEND, it's likely that your OSED rating will drop. And this is hopefully going into the new inspection framework for 2019, where actually the um, outcomes don't have such a big effect. They want no child left behind. Um, and this is a quite an interesting what's talking about what's important. So academic achievements are very important, but it's more than that for schools. So people with SEL disabilities, it's vitally important that they are well prepared for the next stage of their lives. It's about learning to manage relationships with people, learning to make decisions and become independent and finding out what makes you tick. How schools prepare people to do this is vital. And that's a really important thing for a lot of children. Um, but if we're just measuring English and maths, we're not really measuring that. So that's one of the things we need to think about when we look at progress of pupils. Um, what is it we're measuring? Now, special schools are often doing this, but in mainstream schools, they're still generally following that academic curriculum, looking at the English and the maths primarily and looking at the other foundation subjects. But within these mainstream schools, they're going to start having to change the sort of things they teach, what they focus on to better suit those pupils. Um, and this was there from September. They'll be publishing the consultation to their new inspection framework. Uh, and one of the strands is about the children with SEN, um, and he wants you to respond. And there are quite a lot of big changes. It's a move from outcomes uh, more to looking at your curriculum. Um, so the Ofsted summary. Get all of these up. So just to summarise, they will compare the progress of your pupils with um, your pupils with SEND against national data. For pupils at the same starting point but as i said earlier this is across a key stage not within it they have no way of comparing uh, year on year data between schools it's something we're looking at um but it's we're waiting to see how the sort of um situation changes over the next year or so also we'll not ask for data to be in a specific format um so if you are still using p levels they cannot tell you you shouldn't uh, we still don't know how Ofsted and the DfE will see P levels going forward for use on in uh, year assessment. Uh, that is up to each school to decide. Um, and Ofsted understands data for small groups of pupils is unreliable. Um, and for pupils with cognitivity is low, um, everything needs to be done individually. So, as I said, the new inspection framework is due in September 2019. Um, one of the hands out, which I'll link to at the end, um, is actually a slideshow um, from or PowerPoint from Ofsted and it goes into it and it shows you a lot of the changes, how big they are uh, and how they're changing the focus. And I think it is a really big positive thing. Um, I hope it's not a sort of window dressing and behind the scenes it is the same as it was before. I'm hoping there will be really good changes. Um, and I'm, I'm really positive. Um, and this was, I think, from the Ofsted blog again. Um, and it's just there's too much data going on in the schools um, and that needs to drop stop so the teachers can focus on what they're doing they're focused on the teaching uh, and the pupils so yeah Luke Terrell director of corporate strategy so uh, at, at the moment they're asking you to be fully inclusive and they want you to reach the floor standards so at the moment it's 65 percent of um, pupils should reach the floor standard for English, maths, and uh, reading, writing, and maths. Uh, last year, 64% um, met, so still not good enough. Um, and this doesn't work, you can't have both. And I'm hoping with that new Ofsted framework in 2019, um, this will hopefully change um, and hopefully be more achievable, but yet you're somehow supposed to be doing this all with inadequate funding um, and there have been some changes around coasting schools so a coasting school uh, will be a school below the floor standard but they will not receive uh, academy orders unless they also have um, an Ofsted inadequate rating so there is changes around that so again hopefully what Ofsted are doing is getting rid of the fear about how much progress should be made hopefully um, schools will start to see that they're not bringing pressure into making loads and loads of progress and it's actually focusing what the children's need rather than pleasing the senior leadership team or Ofsted or governors and so on. Hopefully people will be confident in what they do 
um, rather than really being worried about what's expected of them. Um, so over the last um, few weeks, we've heard from quite a few schools who've been um, inspected and they always seem to have different stories. Um, so as I said here, offset will or will not really should be, should and should not. So we've had some uh, schools who tell us really positive offset experiences, which are really supportive and liked what they do. Um, other schools have really uh, negative where they're saying this is what you should be doing you can't use that and being very um, imp imp imparting their personal preference on the school um, so things still need to change the officer might be saying it as an overall guidance but the inspectors themselves aren't always following that guidance and I think it's important to know um, what you should or shouldn't do I mean to quote back to those um, statements or sections from the offset inspection framework I mentioned before and use those um, and arm yourself with them so when someone says something like that you pull those out and say that to the offset inspector and challenge them rather than just standing down and letting it date you need to challenge them um, making data work I don't know if all of you have seen this um, there's been a teacher workload advisory group which has been going on for a year or two I think and they released a report on the 5th of November called making data work and basically it's looking at um, the implications of workload uh, with all the data that's being asked of schools uh, I'm only going to give you sort of three highlights um, and it's quite interesting when you read some of the case studies and some of the content in there um, and it is as I said there are practices which go which aren't helpful for people progress they just increase teacher workload so somebody else can look at a graph so one of the things they mentioned is one school does 30 data drops a year which is under every two weeks um, which is ridiculous um, in their eyes and also the government have responded and agreed to this um, and both these documents are going to be in the handouts as well um, so they have no reason to have two or three attainment data collection points a year and from these data points you should be having clear action so once you collect that data you've looked at it what are you going to do next um, and increasing the frequency of collections will not or is not likely to improve the outcomes um, attainment information should only compile centuries as frequently as it is possible for others to act on it so if you're collecting data six times a year you need to hopefully have some action in place part way through the next session um so you can actually then see how um impactful that change has been um and that's why sometimes going out to back to two or three gives you longer to see the impact of that change um and the last one um and the you know, is pay progression should never be dependent on quantitative assessment metrics such as test outcomes um and they talk a lot in the document that's just a statement from there they talk about a lot about how different cohorts and how it's unfair um to expectations of different staff so it is worth the read um to have a look at that so yes yeah, making data work and saying it's in the handouts at the end so you will be able to get hold of that um how much data do i need um as it says here it's better to have less data is of higher quality than more data of lesser quality it gets to a sort of point where a certain amount of data will give you what you need collecting loads of more data won't necessarily give you um, additional insight it might take you longer to do but the actual value of that may decrease um, and when we are when we go to our schools we sort of ask schools how often do you do data drops or collect data and a lot of schools um, over the last years have been saying six times a year um, but we are finding more schools going down to three times a year or some do four times a year but it's spread equally with the autumn term being so long they do a data collection um, either beginning of December or end of November and space it out equally over the uh, year rather than having it each term um, but the assessment process should be ongoing and it should be useful for the teacher so throughout the time of the year the teachers should be doing the assessment they do it in their head however they want to do it and that's for their use and they can be using that to inform their planning looking at interventions and all that sort of stuff but it should be collected two or three times a year so that the uh, senior leadership team or the assessment lead or the senco can then look at that data 
and use it to make informed decisions about thing, about changes they need to make. Um, next, we'll talk about is levels of data. Um, so if you're a connecting step to user and you use our CSAM, teacher level data is what you're recording and your high level data is what you can do with CSAM. You can pull off data really easily. So with the high level data, you're looking at the whole school, you're looking at cohorts within the school to identify gaps in the provision, which groups aren't making the progress you need. Whereas at teacher level data, you're using this to inform your planning, you're looking gaps in, uh, in learning, looking across multiple levels, and it's helping identify those next steps and show the progress is being made. Um, and it is really important. Um, and I think it's important to use a common standardized language across the school. So when you are talking um, about progress and attainment, you can relate to each other. You understand what they mean. There's no area of uh, discrepancy or mixed messages. You all know what that means. Um, and it's clear with those judgments. Um, and then you can use that to discuss attainment, uh, progress, and also areas of difficulty. Uh, so it just helps you when someone says I'm struggling with there and they can look at the data. Someone else might be doing really well in another class and they can go talk to each other uh, and support each other's teaching uh, and improve the people's outcomes. Um, who is in charge of you or your data? Um, so it comes back to saying it's a teacher level data can be easily summarized into high level data. So with our software, Teachers can record information, senior leaders can go straight in and pull that information off. There's nothing requires in between. The summarizing is done automatically and teachers can drill down automatically. Other systems, and if you're using a system where, um, even if you're using our paper files where you're recording information in the, in the pick sheets, then a couple of times a year you've got to count the boxes and then turn it into this and turn it into a graph. It's taking a lot of time and time is money for schools. Um, and you've also got to think of the work-life balance. Um, in schools, I often talk to schools about data, and they spend hours and hours building the data, and they kind of think they've finished when they've produced the graph. But that's when you start looking at it. Building the graph or building the grid should be quite easy. You should then be looking at that, filtering it, uh, sorting it, getting rid of groups, seeing how that changed when you look at um, different things. And then you can hopefully find patterns and go, actually, it's this group that are struggling or these people that are struggling. I now know what I need to do. I need to look at those and work out what I need to do. Not spending hours building the right graph. They go, oh, finished. There we go. There's the graph. But not understanding the graph. It's the understanding that's the important part. Um, and it, so it shouldn't be not how well presented the data look, but what the data tells you. Um, that's important. It really is the crucial part. Um, using data the right way. Um, so data is often used as a judgment. It's really easy to do. Um, you put some data into Excel, you put a formula in, highlight anything which is red, and they've not made good enough progress. How do you know? How does Excel know that child hasn't made good enough progress? What you should use in that situation, don't use that as a judgment, but use it as indicators of questions to ask. Okay, so these five children haven't made the progress we want. We need to find out why. Is it high level of absence? Is there external factors? Um, what are the reasons um, for that? So don't use data as judgment, but use it to inform your own judgment. Okay use that data as part of a conversation um, and data from our assessment framework it hopefully should paint a clear picture of our pupils attainment and to help teachers plan the next step so with our system you could have three children all working on the lp5 um, but all be very different one might be very spiky one might have strengths in one area one might have the next steps for each child is going to be different and the expectations of progress for each child will be different and that's where the conversation needs to happen. And that that's where the data should be used is the evidence. So evidence-based decision-making, and that's where the data comes in. Uh, and that teacher-level data enables that meaningful conversation with parents, senior leaders, and external services. So if, if parents are going, why hasn't my child moved on? You can talk about what skills they're struggling with, but at the same time, you can then look at on the next level, what skills have they achieved? So there is progress. And again, it's relatable, it's meaningful and 
you're not always making a judgment by having these conversations. The parents can make their own judgments. So if you've just said, oh, that's not that, we're still working on it, the parents might say there's a negative thing and they've made the judgment that the school is not doing very well. Where if you can actually share all the things they're doing really well at, but what they're struggling with, and you can show you know what they struggle with and what they're doing really well in, and that will give the parents more confidence and they will judge the school better and be happier about that school. Um, what is data? So everyone thinks numbers. That's the obvious one. What about a story? So um, we always hear on the X factor, the backstory, the sob story. But generally, it tells you to think about where this person's come from, where they're going. And you need to take that into consideration when you're looking at someone's progress. Evidence, so photographic, uh, having conversations, so talking to the child, talking to the parents, talking with other professionals, talking to the uh, lunchtime supervisors, talking to um, the uh, school transport, having a conversation about what that child's doing and understanding, marking, feedback, they're all data. Um, and that's what you can all use to inform your decision about whether or not progress is good enough. Um, so what I've got here, um, you might about see in the top right, but that is the old progression guidance from eight years ago now, the 2010, 2011. Um, and this was a document I think was mis misunderstood uh, and miscommunicated by a few people. It, in reality, it was a really good document. There's lots of useful information, but a lot of people went to the numbers at the back, um, weren't sure if they were good, they didn't measure up well. And then um, when you actually looked at how many pupils were in the cohorts, uh, the small cohorts meant, as often said, it was unreliable. So the data was unreliable, but there is some really good information in the front. So I've got here just a few of the quotes from there. Um, and it's really obvious stuff. So the government have been trying to tell us quite a while in some ways, but in other ways they've been completely ignoring it. So they didn't, haven't agreed with themselves. Um, and it's all about the purpose of assessment and the fact is it enables you to track pupil progress accurately design future learning to adjust to commission or decommission existing provision and to review expectations and learning trajectories. Um, and they're saying broken down to sub levels, they can still be too big for some learners. You need to be looking about progress in a different way and not just looking at the data, having those conversations. Um, and for the children at the very low levels, having that more holistic approach to assessments and not looking at English and maths, and things like the Roche Review, um, then their seven areas of engagement, those working below P4 is kind of reflecting that. Um, so it is there, there is a useful thing. Um, and when you look at this, schools should use the progression data as one of a basket of indicators when evaluating past forms or setting meaningful ambitious targets. Um, so at the end of the webinar, we'll be giving you handouts with some numbers on for expected progress if you're using our primary sets and progression steps. But those numbers is just going to be part of this, not the whole thing. Um, and a small, number, small percentage of learners whose progress could be with the lowest quartile may nevertheless be making good progress. Um, and that comes back to don't use the data to make the judgment. Use the data to give you a question to ask. They could be in the lowest quartile. But then you can ask questions about actually why is this child there? What have they done? What have they achieved this year? And for that child, that might be amazing progress. Uh, or somebody could be in the upper quartile, um, but maybe underachieving. So if you suddenly change the support um, and actually now it's probably better supported, they should be able to achieve a lot more. Um, so it's monitoring that. It's not just cases of upper, upper quartile means good, lower quartile means bad. There's conversations, there's case studies and all those sorts of things. Um, it talks about um, looking, having a focus as a school and your self-evaluation and being confident. And that's what a lot of this comes back to, being confident, knowing your children and being aspirational. What is good progress? I'll come back to it. There is no simple answer. Data does not, should not be used as a judgment of pupils with SCND. It gives us a guide, gives us questions to ask, and there's a framework to use in those conversations. The questions need to be answered by the leads of the professionals working with the pupils. So if a pupil is targeted to make 30% progress, but they've only made 20%, it doesn't mean they haven't made good progress. You need to find out why. Why have they only made 20%? External factors, low attendance, um, haven't got the support required, um, lots of reasons why that child 
has only made 20%, but it could be seen as good progress within the circumstances. Um, database decision making is different to database judgments. So database judgment is where the computer or the system is giving you a judgment of if it's good enough or not. Whereas the database is you using that data to make your own decision. And that's what we should all be doing. We should be doing the database decision making and uh, not the judgments. Um, a lot of you would have seen this one. It's a really popular little cartoon uh, with a quote from Albert Einstein. Everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Um, and I can't remember this cartoon, but it's a great one. Um, we'll judge you all by climbing the tree. And I think that's what we do. And there's a, um, there's a popular autism. Um, if I cannot learn the way you teach, perhaps you should teach the way I learn. And it's adapting what you do to those children. That's what's going to improve pupil outcomes. That's high quality teaching. And that's what we're after. Um, so am I measuring the right thing? So when you look at all the things you need to, that child needs to achieve. Um, so any child with the HCP, you're looking at the four areas of need. Um, and you've got the praying for adulthood. And generally we still focus on that cognition and learning. And for some children, that is the most important bit. The other areas aren't a major concern, and that's right. But at different times in that child's life, that may change. So it might be as they get older, that preparing for adulthood has a much stronger theme for that child. Whereas for another child, the SEMH and the communication interaction is a much bigger priority. So for this child, would judging them on their English and maths progress be the right thing to do? Um, so how, how should schools be doing that? How can we say that actually within these areas they've made really good progress? Um, and that's again how you do that and evidence will play part of that and those conversations. But just focusing on the English and maths within your school may not be the most effective uh, way of judging progress. So am I measuring the right thing? What data are you looking at? This is a really important one. Are you measuring linear or non-linear progress or data? Um, so we've very historically over the last sort of 10, 15 years, always looked at that linear data. Where were they a year ago? Or what level they on? what level they are now? And you kind of have to complete everything on that level, then everything on the, you have to move up in a very linear way. But people's SEND don't learn that way. Um, and we can now look at data in different ways. You can look at skills at different levels um, and lots of different ways. What are we measuring towards? Um, so are we measuring what that child is working towards? If we're working for that preparing for adulthood, how are we measuring that? How are we tracking that? How are we um, judging the progress towards that? Do you look at the progress towards the EHCP, EHCP outcomes when you're looking at progress? So when you're making those judgments, again, are we just looking at English and maths and that? preparing for adulthood as i said how are you measuring towards that um this is again towards one can you turn everything into data not always generally you might be able to turn everything data but then do you want to is it meaningful um are you just turning into data for the sake of it and it doesn't really work so good older plus assess plan do review so we teachers do this day in day out Plan a lesson, you do the lesson, you review, you says you go around in circles. But this needs to be done much higher up as well. So as a school, you should be doing this at multiple levels. So as you, as you do your teaching this year, as you go throughout the year, you'll be reviewing it. Um, so you're recording your assessment data and then your three data drops. What does your data tell you? So when you're looking at a data drop, looking at that data, what is it telling me? what will I then do? And then how will I make those changes? What am I going to do to improve that situation? And then I put it into practice and it goes round at a higher level. This just doesn't just happen in the classroom. This needs to happen when you're looking at data. If you're not using the data to make changes, then why are you collecting the data? Collecting the data and building a book with data and graphs, that's not what you're doing it for. You're building the data to make changes, to improve pupil outcomes. Um, so what does a good progress look like? Um, 
and I've been having a conversation with a number of pupils like this because when you look at um, mainstream settings and uh, you look at like, teaching over time, um, you may look at a teacher's uh, or observe a teacher's lesson and give a judgment, but then you'll look at their data and depending on what their data shows, you will give you that judgment over progress over time. Um, because if you may have thought their lesson was outstanding, when you look at the data, the children aren't making the progress the uh, government would like, then they can't be judged outstanding because the progress would be there. So progress and teaching, quality teaching, is very much linked. Um, and it's easy to see when you can uh, measure uh, attainment in the SATs at the end of the key stage. It's really great to be able to sit there and go, if you've done that, our, te our quality of teaching must be good. Now with the SEND, you've somehow got to do the other. You've got to somehow look at your teaching, look at your quality of teaching, push the quality of teaching, really promote and lead on it and support. Um, and by doing that, you will hope for your, you'll increase the chance of higher pupil outcomes. You're not going to fix anything. You've got, you can't suddenly miraculously make uh, progress, which isn't there, but the high quality teacher will allow children to reach their potential. Um, and I say good progress is different for people with SEND. But if progress is low in English and maths, has the focus been in other areas? Just because the progress is low in English and maths, they could still have made good progress. Uh, so how do I promote good progress? As I'm saying, is focus on the high quality teaching. What does the high quality teaching look like in your school? Um, and again, talking uh, to Lorraine Peterson recently, um, she was talking about working on the basics and building from there and it comes back to this pressure to make progress the pressure to push children through levels rather than just rushing through levels and the 2014 curriculum addressed this is make sure the children have the basics the beginning part will take longer the lower skills will take longer to achieve because you're making sure they've really got them you're not just rushing through them because they've done it once you're really making sure they understand them by doing that when you then go further on what you're then teaching will build on top of those skills it's going to use those skills so you really need a strong foundation on those skills before you move on if you don't when they try and achieve those higher level skills they haven't got the scaffolding they haven't got the structure the skills to use and call upon um to achieve that so you're really going to start you might get the early progress but then they'll really start to fall off because they haven't actually mastered the basics um and i think it's and a lot of these things, it's, you need to remove the pressure to show progress. And by doing that, you'll actually will increase the progress. Instead of rushing through stuff and actually even them, teachers will actually spend time and make sure children have achieved stuff before they move on, which means later on the children will make more progress. Um, how important is engagement? Uh, so from the Rochford Review, um, they talk about assessing engagement allows teacher education to monitor the varying degrees of attention and so on and it looks at their motivation um, so high quality teaching will lead to raise pupil engagement because if you're doing it right if you're pitching it at the right level you've structured it in a way that you know your children will respond that means you're doing high quality teaching and it means your pupils will be engaged and if they're engaged, it's, it's, it will improve their educational outcomes. They're going to achieve more by being engaged through high quality teaching. Um, and that engagement is, is crucial. So with the Roche Review, they had the uh, CLDD project, which they looked at for people's P1 to P4 about sort of uh, measuring their engagement. But that's not something you just do down P1 to P4. That is something you do all the way through. Um, you do that as any ability people, any age, uh, you do it in staff meetings. He's actually looking at the people you're working with, how engaged are they? The more engaged they are, the more they're going to get out of this. If what I'm doing, everyone's finding extremely boring, they don't need it, the engagement will be low, the outcomes will be low. So um, looking at those seven areas of engagement from the CLDD project, we can do that all the way through. And if the children are engaged, the outcomes will follow. Um, so involving how we look at progress. So the, I'm just doing a couple of different things. So within our analysis software, within connecting steps, we can track more than just what's being achieved. So the green bit at the bottom, they are what skills uh, the child can do independently. The dark yellow are what skills the child can do with a little bit of support and the light yellow 
where they require a lot more support. And you can see over that time that although the number of skills they're being independently achieving is only going up slowly, they're doing a lot more skills with limited support and a lot more um, with uh, more support. So they're getting um, you could curriculum coverage, they're covering a lot of stuff, doing different levels of attainment, so they're making progress. But is this enough to tell me, is this good progress? Um, if we look at something else, so nonlinear progress. So again, within our software, uh, looking at this, so what this is showing me is it's looking at English reading for a child. So the colours are three different levels. So this is the LP level. So pink is the P6, the yellow is the P7, and the turquoise blue is the P8. And I can see that child has made progress over three different levels. If we look at it in the way the government currently does, which we look at their current level, they've only made 25% progress. But if we look at all three levels, then they've actually made 88% progress overall. So with that spiky profile, they actually have made a lot of progress. It's not where the government wants it, not where the government likes it. But again, is this good progress? Is that enough information for me to decide if that is good progress enough? So the next one, a picture of a child holding a pencil with two adults. Is this good progress? I do not know. There's probably a story behind that photo. There's a story that might be that child's first interaction with adults in the classroom. There's, there could be many things behind that, which could mean it's really good progress or it might not. But using that on its own isn't enough. I need to have that conversation. Um, when we look at data, we always have to look at different cohorts. So when Ofsted come in, they always look at the free school meals, not free school meals, the pupil premium, all those groups they have to look at. And you need to look at these to ensure equality and supporting disadvantaged children. So you need to know uh, which ones aren't doing so well and then focus on that. But as well as those, what other cohorts are in your school? Um, are there any cohorts that you can identify with low levels of progress? So could it be actually you've got a group of people with low attendance? Can you do something about that? Are there children? What, what is the reason? What can you find out within your data? What pupils aren't making progress? Can you identify them as a cohort? And then what can you do? And it comes back to that plan, do, review. What can you identify? What can you work out? What can you put it into action? Um, so I'll just bring all this up. So this here is um, for pupils working towards the sort of um, end of year outcomes for primary. So this is a question we're always asked, how much progress should a child in year six working at year two, what rate of progress should they achieve? Okay, that's what we're asked a lot. And there is no national number, there's no national data. Um, as I said, I keep hearing from Ofsted, that um, a child with SEND should make the same progress as their peers, uh, or a child in year two or in year six should make a year's progress each year just in line with their peers. Problem is, mathematically, it doesn't add up. So for a child in year five, working at the pre-key stage standard three level, which is uh, age five, so that's taken that child 10 years to get to sort of um, uh, uh, age five developmentally. So it's taken them 10 years, so it's taken, so they're gonna make around 50% progress each year. If you've got a child in year six, working at year two, realistically, they're making around 64% progress a year. Now this is extremely simplified, um, and as it says on the left, it is just taking a really simplistic view. It's assumed that effective provision has been the same throughout, there's no specific needs um, and as soon as you look at them then that's going to change um, so if the provision has changed now much more effective you should have higher expectations of progress if a pupils may um, have specific needs there may be less progress so i'm giving you numbers to use and there is going to be a document with this um, in the handouts but these are starting points so if you've got a child in year six working at year two has only made 40% progress, only achieved half. 
it gives you questions to ask. Whereas if you're hitting 64%, you can sit there and go, actually, that's pretty good. It looks pretty good. But can we do more? But it's those conversations. Using this as a starting point, using this as a framework for that conversation to sort of see what your expectations are. Um, for the engagement steps, so if you're new to B squared, engagement steps is our assessment framework for pupils working below P4. So this is a non-formal curriculum. It's, it's not looking at English, math, or science or anything like that. It's looking at uh, responsiveness, um, persistence, initiation, discovery. Very different. And it's very, very individualized. So they shouldn't be setting generalized attainment targets. You will not be looking at linear progress. You'll be looking at very spiky progress, looking at non-linear, very individualized. And you need to really support, use your evidence to support the assessments. Um, so we're still waiting on this to be finalized. So this was something the Rochford you recommended. Um, you're still using P levels for these children this year. Um, but we have heard recently that hopefully the report uh, confirming what's happening next year for children P1 to P4 hopefully will be out before Christmas. But if not, we're expecting it early next year. Um, if you're using our progression steps, so progression steps are for children um, generally going to be using special schools or secondary schools uh, for their SEN children who don't want to mention age. So instead of using end of year outcomes, we use our own levelling structure and one to six are based on the pre key stage standards but broadened out. Uh, and what you can see by representative image is the levels are not equal sizes, which is really annoying. Um, but we have stuck to the government's structure, which makes it much more uh, easy to understand and relatable. Um, and because they're not equal, the progress on one level will not be compared to progress on a different level. Linear progress, again, still might not be the effective way of evaluating progress because of their spiky profile. They might be really good at the um, decoding, but not the uh, comprehension. Um, a reminder, these curriculum areas are not the only uh, outcomes people are working on. Um, in the front of the national curriculum, it always says the national curriculum is part of your school's wider curriculum. Um, and as so I one of the handouts is going to be the progression steps, the progress guidance document. And um, what that's going to do, it's got numbers in there and it does it all over. Do not use for judgment. It will give you an idea of the amount of progress children should make on different levels, um, which you can then go away and go, that's what I'm aiming for this year. If they don't reach, why not? What, have, what, what, what do we need to do? What do we need to put in place? How do we support them? If they have achieved it, excellent, well done. What can we do going forward? Um, tracking towards outcomes. Um, I've seen this done in a few schools um, and on its own, I personally hate it. Um, but if you use it in conjunction with other things, it can work well. Uh, but if we look at these two things, so 70% of free school meals, pupils achieve their targets. 40% uh, of the non-free school meals, pupils achieve their targets. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I don't know because on its own these numbers don't tell me anything about progress or attainment was the school less aspirational for their free school meal pupils so for their free school did they set easier to achieve targets which meant more pupils achieved well, on their own you can't do anything and I, and I have been at a school where we looked at this they were really proud of this and we actually looked at the data and what the actual progress and attainment data showed was the free school meal pupils were actually falling further behind than their non-free school meal pupils. So because they're tracking towards outcomes, they believed that they were making better progress where actually their data showed they weren't. So they were being less aspirational for their pupils with free school meals than their non-free school meal pupils. And it kind of took them down the garden path they didn't quite know. So here's a question. What does it mean if all pupils achieve their outcomes? And what does it mean if no pupils achieve their outcomes? If all pupils achieve their outcomes, you're not setting ambitious targets. It's not that you've done amazingly well, it's that you weren't pushing them, you weren't stretching them. And if no pupils achieve their outcomes, it still means you're not very good at setting targets. It doesn't matter if it's 30% achieve their targets, 70% achieve their targets. It doesn't really matter. What I'm more interested in is how close were they to their targets. So if you set a target and they were all miles off, then you're not very good at looking at where the children will be, not looking at their past data, you're not using it uh, effectively. Where in reality, that all, most, of your, most of your children just missed out, and a few of them children reached, 
it meant you were setting really aspirational targets and some of them achieved it and some of them don't. So tracking towards outcomes can be a misleading number to look at. Um, let's say, what is it? It doesn't tell us a lot. If we're hitting 0% achieved in outcomes or 100%, it means we're not setting data or targets, um, realistic targets. Uh, but apart from that, it doesn't tell us a huge amount. So this is a good one. What do I tell Ofsted? How have you used your data? So I think that's what Ofsted are looking at. If you're collecting data, if you're producing all these graphs, what is it telling you? How are you using it? And then what changes are you implementing based on that data? If you're not using what your data is telling you, if you're not getting anything from your data, then you haven't got enough data. Um, so some of the mainstream schools um, I work with when looking at uh, using B Square, they say, who should we use it with? And they're generally looking for the low level pupils working below year one that they can't show progress with. Um, and as they actually look at it, they creep that up to almost being any child working outside of their year group. Because although they can say where the child is in their current system and they can show a little bit of progress, it's not helping them to identify where the children aren't making progress. It's not helping them identify where the intervention should be and where to target support. It's telling them they're just below, but not where they're just below. Um, and that's having that teacher level data to use that to identify areas to put uh, interventions in, to target support in those areas, and hopefully see those outcomes improving. Um, and it can, it's that plan do review. Um, have you identified good progress? Again, this is you as a school. How have you identified what does good progress mean within your school? Um, this is a good one. Have you judged progress as being good when academic progress is low? And this again comes that we're not just looking at English and maths. For this year, the focus for the pupil might be um, coming into the classroom, uh, remaining on task, and the actual focus hasn't hugely been on the English and maths. That's going to follow next year when we overcome these barriers, the barriers to progress. So if you're actually working on those, that might mean that this child has made really good progress, even though the academic progress is low. And it's having the evidence, it's having that story, the case study around why actually you feel this people's made good progress, even when academic progress has been low. Um, so saying, what have you done about your pupils who've judged as not making good progress? So you've identified some pupils not making good progress, you've looked at them, and you've judged them as making not good progress. What are you then going to do about it? How are you going to support them? What changes are you going to make? And that's generally what Ofsted are doing. They're often pulling at threads. Um, they're pulling at something to find out, do you know this happens? And the first thing is, do you know this exists? Do you know this? And the next bit is, what are you doing about it? what are you going to do and then looking for the evidence of okay so what have you done so previous things you've done where is the evidence and where's the impact um this one i almost missed off but um i was reminded is just because you've got good progress at the moment how are you going to ensure it remains good what does it mean you made to improve progress are your pupils working towards relevant outcomes so if all your pupils are making really amazing english and mass progress what's important to your children what actually should they be working towards um and i was working at school in um last week and we're asking what is good progress having this whole conversation and in this school there uh was a child who is not expected to live past the end of this school year and the question is what is good progress for that child if in a year's time they're not going to be alive, is good progress going to be looking at their English scores or their math scores? Or is good progress them being less scared about what's coming? They're coming to terms with what's coming. What is good progress for that child? What is going to be your outcomes? What's important for that child? Um, it's not always going to be so simple. Um, and what cohorts have you identified are not making good progress? So you need to answer all those questions you need to say how you've used your data you need to give all this information to Ofsted you need to sort of say oh we found we weren't doing this very well but this is what we've put in place and we're already seeing improvements or you can mention something you, you identified previously 
that's what goths often want to see. They want to see those constant changes, constant using that data, putting it as good use and making changes. Um, so just to summarize, there is no simple rule. Okay, everyone wants a simple rule. There is no simple rule. Everything is individualized. Don't use data to make judgments, but use it as part of that conversation about progress. It does take longer to do. You could put all the information in an Excel spreadsheet, judge all your pupils and make a nice graph and be happy or not. But when you're doing that, you're not going to understand that so you can't really make decisions. But if you have that conversation using the data, you'll be able to make decisions, you'll be able to look at it, you'll be able to identify what makes good, what looks like good progress in your school. What does it look like? Um, what good progress looks like for a child in P6 and a child working down at P2? Very different. Um, are you measuring the right areas? So it comes down to preparing for adulthood, the four broad areas of need. And it's remembering data is more than just numbers. So yeah, we do an analysis module called CSAM where you can do lots of graphs, but at the same time, we also do Eversense. And Eversense is our evidence tool. And the tagline for that is tell the story, because that's what it's all about. It's telling that child's story, showing you what areas of uh, difficulty they've got, what they've overcome, what they've achieved, what they've been part of, all that sort of stuff tells that child's story and it helps you understand if progress is good enough. Understand what your data is telling you. Um, that is a huge one. Um, and I work with schools who they have the data, they don't fully understand it and I help them look at their data and find patterns and sit there and go, actually, there's a group of people here who aren't making as much progress. I can identify that, I can give them um, uh, observations but they then have to go and ask those questions within that school it's not something I can help with I can help them read the data but as a school that's where those discussions in happen and that's where the decisions uh, happen and you have to make decisions you have to make the decisions based on your data and then act on them if you're not doing that why are you collecting the data if you're not doing that you're only really collecting data for your Ofsted and your local authority you're not using it for you your teachers or your pupils it's about working smarter, not harder. So things shouldn't be laborious. It shouldn't take hours to do stuff. It should be quicker and easier. Use computers to do the work for you rather than you spending a lot of your time. And also with Ofsted, it's about being confident. It's about knowing your school, knowing your pupils. Um, I've, I spent last week in Scotland um, and it was a really interesting week because I've been working with schools in Scotland now for a couple of years and they are very different to England. What they use in our software is very different to what schools in England use. In England, we're all about the data and graphs and the progress. In Scotland, they're all about what experiences that child has and when they look for progress what the inspectors are after is evidence they're not after a graph they're after you said the child can do this where is your evidence you've got this judgment where is your evidence um, and it, it's it seems a lot nicer the way they look at stuff um, and it's more supportive and it's more positive people aren't feeling negative because the graphs aren't where they should be they can actually celebrate the, the ev what the progress children are making they've got the evidence um but at the same time they're now starting to look at data and they're looking at um working across schools but generally they're doing that they're looking at sort of moderating um making sure they've got the same understanding their expectations are the same they're not sitting there doing graph and comparing school pupils in different schools in terms of data they're looking at the teacher's judgments and looking at what the different schools are doing and supporting each other. Um, and it's really interesting the way, um, you know, the differences between Scotland and England um, over the year. So, so on the handouts, so there's a couple of handouts. So if you use our software and you're using our progression steps, there's a document um, to give you guidance on progress. If you're using the primary steps, there's some guidance on progress. Um, I mentioned earlier, um, making data work um, so that will give you that uh, which is a report for teacher workload advice group 
there's the government's response and there's working towards the education inspection framework 2019 from Ofsted. So that is a link. Uh, and to get to the handouts, if you go to that website address, so www.bsquared.co.uk forward slash handouts, you'll be able to get access to those. But have a look at that inspection framework from Ofsted. Have a look at what changes they're recommending, um, what they want to bring in, how big the changes are. It's a big move away from outcomes, looking at your curriculum, uh, and preparing the children for the next stage of their life. Um, so that's going to be really big changes. And hopefully that pressure uh, on data is going to be reduced. So they're saying you still use data, but it's for your use to improve the outcomes, not because you're going to be judged on it or because you're being made to do it. You do it because it's what you want. So what I am going to do... Um, Can't do it there. No, can't do it there. Um, so that's a handout. So bsquared.coding forward slash handouts. Um, that's the sort of end of the webinar. So we're now on to the QA section. Uh, and please, before you leave, it would be really helpful for us if you could um, complete our survey. So this one is looking at how you show progress and how you judge progress and things like that so if you could um have a go to that website address and fill in our survey uh that would be really really helpful and um, what i'm just going to do now is have a look through uh the questions we received um and have a look answer, answer ones i can um, if you have any questions please uh type away uh, and thank you all uh, for attending. I'll say that now before I forget. Um, in the bottom right, you do have my contact details. You have got my email and my telephone number. Um, I'm out of the office for the next week and a half, so if you have any questions or any information you want from me, please email me rather than calling. Uh, but I am available. Um, so I'm just going to read through the questions. Um, so uh, Elizabeth asked... What does national data mean when we all use different types of data? Um, there is a national data set for end of key stage one and key stage two, which uh, the government use. So that is where they do look at national data, but it is uh, sort of uh, it sets results key stage one to sets results key stage two. It's, um, and that is where the pre key stage standard goes in, the interim performance, that's where that goes in. Um, and they do use that. Um, to look and judge progress based on that by saying it is over a key stage. Um, it is available off the DFE. If you can't find it, if you send me an email, that's all of you, if you can't find that and you'd like a copy, if you send me an email, um, I will send it uh, by return. Um, it's not the easiest thing to find and it's not the most obvious place to find it, but it is available. Um, Um, buh, 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 buh. Okay. Um. <laughs> Somebody um, has been offset recently and they weren't happy with the definition of uh, good progress being pupil specific. They wanted a general definition um, of so many sub levels over the key stage. Um, they're not allowed to do that. That's where that confidence comes in, going back to looking at the offset framework, looking at this information. There is no guidance anywhere which will tell you what the expected progress is. Um, if you looked at the old progression um, guidance, it was, top of my head, it was roughly for children working over level one, it was two levels progress over the three years. Um, if they're working below that, then the expectation is less. And that was also, that was the only upper quartile. Um, it doesn't work because as soon as you put that in, you can sit there and say, well, this child's got this condition. This is how we're supporting them. It's not as effective as we want it to be, but we're on a limited budget, so we can't really do that. So for him, for what we have, that is good progress. Um, and it is going to be pupil specific. And this comes back to where that was an office inspector 
deciding that it is judgeable like that, but it isn't. Um, so that's the bit, it comes back to their confidence. There is no, so I can't give any more about what good or outstanding progress looks like. Um, one of the things um, people should do is it's working together. So one of the things we asked in the process of setting up is we are setting up a Facebook group called B Squared Together. Uh, we can use that to help um, match schools together so they can work together and identify what good progress looks like. Um, but it will come back to um, working uh, with groups of schools and supporting each other. Um, so Jenny, you mentioned that small groups of pupils do not have significant relevant data. <laughs> How few pupils become significantly not relevant? They don't, they don't give us that information, does Ofsted. They also, um, they put low in quotes and they don't tell us what low means. Um, but, and generally what I find within an SEN school, most of the cohorts you're looking at will be uh, uh, significantly relevant because you'll have too many variations within that and you won't be able to get a realistic picture. Um, I think that comes down to is, I would say 30, 40, 50 pupils um, starts getting reasonable because at that point the number of people not fitting the norm is less but as soon as you have five or ten every child going to be individual the group data is absolutely meaningless um, so Sarah Harness is using um, primary steps um, in a resource base, and you're highly praised. Great, well, excellent. Um, you have two options. So, with the primary steps, we have a primary steps and we have progression steps. The level co range they cover is very similar. The difference with the progression steps is it doesn't mention their age. Uh, so, that comes down to your personal preference. Do you want to mention their age in a secondary school setting? So, a child in year eight is working at year one or would you rather use a different leveling structure um if you want to have a conversation about that um it might be a good idea sarah to um go to our website and you can arrange an online meeting uh, with myself and my colleague john and we can show you the different options and have a conversation about what's right for you um I th I'm hoping I've answered everyone's questions. Um, oh, I've got one in the Q&A. Uh, government data on the progress uh, free school meals, pupil premium always makes for worrying reading, particularly when looking at the gap in attainment of GCSEs. Are you aware of any data on free school meal progress that is relevant to pupils not taking formal questions, but the end of key stage four in terms of age? Um, as far as I know, there is absolutely none. So we worked with um, a group of secondary schools in Leeds, um, and one of my questions were, um, what is the guidance around what children in Key Stage 4 should be doing? Um, should they follow GCSEs regardless because that's what they should do, or should the school actually think about what is relevant for that child and suit what's most suitable? Um, and the current pressure because of the Progress 8 scores and all that means every child should be doing GCSEs. Um, hopefully the 2019 inspection framework that will change. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there is absolutely no guidance. Um, there is nothing else really out there. I, I'm still not 100% sure on how the different qualifications uh link into and what scoring you get as a score and how that affects your progress eight scores with GCSEs or the old GCSEs get points for different ones which can add up but I don't know how that works um, we are doing um, something called adult st um, steps for life which is kind of post 16 post 14 stuff which is looking at what is relevant for children so preparing them for adulthood so work skills, life skills, all that sort of stuff. Um, but we're looking at the more developmental, it works for them, it's what they want. But we don't know what the pressures will be in terms of qualifications for those pupils going forward. Um, uh, Carol just asked how much the system cost. It is a um, 
completely modular system. So generally what you do is you buy our software and the starting cost for up to 30 children is about £800 the first year. After that, it's £150 a year. So we don't like uh, hitting you every year. What we'd rather do is you spend the money once and then we keep the ongoing cost as low as possible. Um, if you'd like to have a look at what we do, how it all works, um, on our website, so bsquared.co.uk, you'll see on lots of different pages a free online meeting. Um, you can click on that and basically we get something which is similar to this. So where we, I share my screen and show you, and I can talk to you and share you everything. But we get to talk, take you through the software and show you what everything does. Um, uh, thank you, Michelle, for the hub and, uh, Michelle, for the feedback. I'm glad you like the engagement steps. Um, it will change at some point. We don't know how much. Um, but yeah, it's the engagement steps is a huge uh, improvement over what was previously available for children working sort of P1 to P4. Makes It's much more suitable, much more scope of progress. Um, but it does take a while to get your head around about the changes uh, and, and get also how you report that data. And I look forward to Ofsted guidance on what good progress looks like down at that level. That will be nice and interesting fun. Um, so David's ask, is there anywhere we can compare the progress our pupils making against national data sets? Um, that is something my colleague John is currently we're looking at. So previously uh, with the old um, P-Levels National Curriculum, schools could export data from um, our software and other software and import into CASPER. Um, problem is all the different systems have changed what they do. CASPER has kind of stayed still and not moved. Um, so it's not really compatible. Um, we would like them to be because it would save us a lot of work. Um, but our current plans over the next sort of two years is to start looking at our own comparative data. So John is going to be contacting um, some schools over the next few months about using their data to trial and start providing data in that sort of way. But the idea is in the future, you'll be able to compare um, your setting against other settings um, and really fine tune so you can look at uh, a pupil with autism working in progression step four in year nine and look at how your pupils progress against nationally so the government said they don't want it they don't need it but yet as somebody has found uh, the office inspector wasn't happy with their interpretation of what good progress is even though it's very individual but yeah that's where we are heading that way um, as long as the uh, fashion of Ofsted still asking that question is going. Um, okay, I think um, uh, Suzanne has asked, um, they've recently moved to primary steps from uh, NC levels. Uh, primary steps works with CSAM Ab as of about two hours ago. So uh, my colleague John has updated the software this evening um, and CSAM is now available for primary steps and progression steps. Um, leave, I've asked all the questions. Um, Um, so uh, Julian's written, all you discussed about primary engagement steps um, is connecting steps available. Connecting steps is the assessment software. So within that, you're, you, you could be using our early years, which is early steps. You could be using our P-level national curriculum frameworks. Um, the primary steps, the engagement steps and progression steps are our new frameworks to replace the uh, P-level and national curriculum. They're still within connecting steps. So connecting sets won't go anywhere. And also, if you purchase something, we're not going to remove your content. So because you purchased um, the content you have, you will still have that for as long as you need it. 
Um, we still don't know um, how the government's going to feel about P levels over the next year. Uh, we kind of got to wait and see. Um, I know a lot of authorities worrying about how they're going to um, look at progress for AHCPs and all that sort of stuff. Uh, because if every school does their own thing, it's going to be really hard to get an overview for the whole authority. Um, so we are looking at schools, uh, talking to schools about that and local authorities. Um, has anyone got any other questions? You're welcome. Um, so had a question from Facebook Live, um, which she might not be watching live, so she'll get this at some point, uh, which actually linked to the Scottish curriculum. Um, and the answer is, as the milestones are developed, we will be adding other stuff. We have heard in the pipeline, there will be um, health and wellbeing uh, milestones. Uh, we're waiting uh, on those before we do anything around the sensory and physical stuff. Um, if I've answered your question, um, but I haven't gone into enough detail, or you're still not sure, um, please just let me know and I'll try to answer your question further. Um, so although there's still quite a few of you connected, I will be ending it here. Um, you will all get an email um, in 23 hours time. Uh, thank you for attending and also have links to the feedback survey um, and also um, a link so you can watch this um, webinar on our blog. Um, so that will be on our uh, page going forward. Um, what I'm just going to do so I'll just bring up our website so on our website um, on our blog we always put all our previous webinars um, 
So we've got our introduction to our analysis software. You've got transitioning to our new frameworks. Um, and further down, you've got free training and our um, Are You Ready for Removal of P-Levels webinar. So there's lots of information about all the changes going on at the moment. Um, our coming webinars, so on here, um, beginning of December, we've got our Connecting Steps training. Um, we've got, um, if you're a Scottish school, we've got What Our Products Do For Scotland. Uh, and one of the ones we disappeared, which I'll make sure is back later for some reason. Oh, it is there, so I missed it. Um, introduction guide to using our autism progress framework. Um, so if you've seen the AET um, uh, autism framework, uh, it's similar to that, but more detailed, um, easier to use, but also it comes with a range of strategies. Um, so the idea is you can help profile someone's autism um and then use the strategies to help support that child or person um so that's our next webinar which is in two weeks time and we've actually got um a guest host which is uh jasmine miller who was part of the development and she was uh principal of new Street school in scotland um is now a consultant um who can help schools around autism and also uh, leadership. So that'll be our next webinar in two weeks. Cool. Um, and to get to the handouts, so bsquare.co.uk say forward slash handouts. And you can see here, we've got the guide, guidance on progress, the uh, making data work and the teacher workload. Also, we've got the link to the uh, changes to the inspection framework and how that looks. And then all the changes around that. And focusing on the curriculum rather than um, the outcomes. So it's, it's worth um, going through that uh, and having a look about what's coming. Um, so it helps you think about what you're gonna have to do in the future. Okay, um, so thanks again for attending. Um, and any questions, if I haven't had a chance to answer them, uh, please contact me by email or telephone. Um, they're all, all the handouts, so thank you once again. <laughs>